Jimbo Paris, and you are listening to the Jimbo Paris Show. All right. Hello, everyone. I am Jimbo Paris. Welcome again to the Jimbo Paris Show. Today, we have a very special guest. His name is Jeff Razley. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that correctly. I apologize if I'm not. He is the author of 14 different books. He's published hundreds of academic articles. He's been on over 150, close to about that, different podcasts. And again, I've been researching him a lot. This is a very successful person. I've, and he's basically all across YouTube. And he even has an internship that's named after himself. So let's sit down and kind of speak to him. This seems like a very interesting individual. Namaste, Jimbo. So, how have you been? Well, I uh, just came off a pickleball court after playing a couple hours of pickleball. And uh, we have a, a, a third creature here. My little cat is wandering around. Um, so she may pop her head in now and then, but, but she's quiet. She won't have anything to say. Right. How are you? Excellent. Yeah, I'm doing great. And I'll be doing even better now that I'm doing this interview with you. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. My pleasure. So, first of all, let's kind of get into you. What is your profession? I was a lawyer for 30 years. And about the last 15 of those 30, I was the head of a small law firm. So I, you know, not only handled cases, uh, I was the primary manager of the firm. While I was practicing law, I mostly wrote articles. But as my law practice wound down and then I retired from the law, I devoted myself more and more to writing books. And so that's how I've managed to have 14 published, most of them in the last 10 years since I managed to escape the law. And what was the journey like? The journey into law was I was really interested in just learning everything I possibly could about everything under the sun after I got into my mid-teenage years. And so I did things like I hitchhiked across the country. I did a motorcycle trip with a, a friend all the way through North America, way down into Mexico, uh, half a summer studying in Europe and then hitchhiked around Europe. And then finally kind of got serious about just focusing my education on the actual academic side and graduated from the University of Chicago College and then went to law school. and. I really wanted to do impactful social justice type work in law. And so for the first few years, I worked for an organization called Legal Services Organization. And we did poverty law cases and social justice cases. The two that were the most important to me were that I worked on. We forced two different counties in Indiana to build new jails because their jails were just were over 100 years old and the conditions were really horrible. And then I decided I really wanted to start making money. So I went into private practice with a big corporate firm, learned the business side of law, and then struck out with two of my best friends from that firm. And we started our own firm and uh, had, you know, it's a good success over the years. So. Tell me about your first ever published book. It was called Bringing Progress to Paradise, What I Got from Giving to a Himalayan Mountain Village. And the book tells my story of getting into Himalayan mountain climbing, which I did in my early 40s, and transitioning from just using the Himalayas as a wonderful place for adventures to becoming a 
serious philanthropist and starting a foundation over in a remote area in Nepal, which I'm still the president of, and working to develop basic infrastructure for this remote area is called BASA. And the foundation is called the BASA Village Foundation. And the, when I first went to BASA in 2008, there was no running water, no electricity, no vehicles with wheels, no roads, no internet, no radios, no TV. They, but they did have a little village school with three grades. And they asked me if I could raise or donate $5,000 that would be enough money to buy the materials to add a fourth and a fifth grade to their school and to pay two teacher salaries for three years. And I was really kind of amazed that such a small amount of money could do so much. So I agreed to do it. And then I just sort of fell in love with this village. The people there were just wonderful and they're so tough because they live such hard lives, but also so sweet and kind. And so I turned that initial project eventually into this foundation. And we've done electricity, water, computers, another school building, a medical clinic, sort of all the basic infrastructure that, you know, people need for you know, just kind of the basic uh, quality of life in the modern world. What we wanted to be very careful about was to try not to change the local culture because they have a really beautiful culture and we didn't want to impact that in any negative way. And, you know, it's been a very interesting experiment to see if you could bring these modern quality of life services to a village that was basically live has been living the same way for 500 years so it's an ongoing experiment and the latest project that we actually just approved is to develop an agricultural project which will involve raising goats and pigs because the village doesn't really have a sustainable economy all of the villagers are just subsistence farmers. So they grow what they eat, they eat what they grow. If there's a bad weather season, it's very dangerous. And the only real work that pays money for these Himalayan villages for the men to hire on to expedition companies. And because of COVID, the last you know few years, trekking and mountaineering tourism went way down in Nepal. So all those guys lost their jobs. And back a few years before that, they had terrible earthquakes and tourism died for another year and a half. So we're going to work on developing this project to create a sustainable business for the village to you know, bring in regular revenue. So why did you become president? President of the foundation? Yeah. Because I started it when the villagers asked me to you know raise this money for their school i did it by asking other friends who were trekkers and climbers who had some connection with nepal if they'd like to contribute to it so and at first you know i thought well that would just be a one off thing but after i visited the village and then they said well you know you look across this huge valley and we can see lights over there. And we know these other villages have electricity and they have lights. And the teachers in the school said, we would really love to be able to study at night. But, you know, it's very difficult to do that without electricity. And so how about raising money to build a little hydroelectric system here? So that led to the creation of the foundation because that was going to involve more money and more people and we needed the expertise of an engineer and that's how it came about so what inspired you to become a writer i grew up in a family of journalists my mom and step grandfather and stepfather were all editors of our local paper 
And so I was around writers growing up. And then I married my wife as a writer and an English professor. And she had her first novel published when she was just 21 years old, long before my first book was published. And so it's just been something I've been around all my life. And I, as a teenager, started just wanting to express myself, wrote some poetry, most of which was pretty bad, but eventually developed some skill in writing poetry and had a few poems published when I was in college and then transitioned into writing articles for legal journals. And then because I've always loved and done a lot of traveling, I uh, wrote a number of articles about adventure travel. And I didn't want to write articles like, oh, this is a nice hotel and this is a great restaurant. Uh, that Writing like that never appealed to me. But so I would do what I thought was an interesting travel experience and then think about, well, what did I really get out of this? You know, what did I get out of it beyond just, oh, it was fun. You know, experiencing a different culture, meeting people who were very different from me. And so the, those were, I wrote a lot of articles like that. And then eventually in my very last year of practicing law, had the time to work on that book about my experience in Nepal and Bassa. What does success mean to you? That's a really interesting question, I think. I mean, you can think about it very superficially, but that actually occupies several chapters in the last book of mine, the 72 Wisdoms book. And I, I actually, in different chapters, look at different ways of understanding success. But for me, you know, ultimately, what it means is living a meaningful life that, you know, whatever I'm doing is expresses meaningful, meaningfulness, worthiness to have lived a life in which you did things that helped other people and you really enjoyed the life you have, then you put that together. So there's a selfish and there's an unselfish side to it. If all you do is have a good time or satisfy some need of yours, like to make money or to have status, that's definitely important, but that's only half of the yin and the yang. The other side of it is having an effect that other people benefited from your life. And so that's how I look at it. And I also, there's an, one other sort of twist to this. I look at creating a life like creating a work of art. And so also a successful life, it should be beautiful. If you feel like you have been successful, you can look at your life and say, yeah, you know, okay, lots of things went wrong, disappointments, failures, whatever. But all in all, I have lived a beautiful life. But I think that comes with feeling like I've, I've done things I really enjoy and I've had really interesting, cool experiences. But I also affected other people in a, in a really positive way. Are there any misconceptions that you may have personally received as a writer? There are some people who review books on Amazon. And for the, the last several books I've done, we have uh, an exclusive distribution agreement with Amazon. So for some reason, there are some people that will write a review on Amazon or in Goodreads, and they will say, this book needs an editor. And it's not just mine, but you often see that critique, that review. And certainly in some cases, that's definitely true. But when I've seen that, and, and I think I've only seen that on, you know, maybe two, two of my books, but it's like, okay, that person is really not 
serious because I have an editor. If the, the critique would be, this book needs an editor because I found, you know, seven different typos and five grammatical mistakes. And I said, oh, wow, you know, you're right. Then, okay, <laughs> my editor didn't do a very good job. You see that statement, this book needs an editor. It's like, that is really annoying because, you know, what does that mean? Especially if the book has had an editor, which, yeah, there are definitely some books that are published, self-published on Amazon where the book didn't have an editor and you, and you can see that. But, you know, I, I've seen typos in books published by the biggest, you know, major New York publishing companies. And, you know, it's actually very rare to see, to read a book carefully and not find a typo or two. So, you know, if that's the point somebody was trying to make, well, you know, really that's rather picky and juvenile. To the, even worse is to say, well, this book needs an editor. So that's that's sort of a pet peeve I have, and I, you know, because I did experience that at least twice. Um, that's one of those things that you know are annoying. <laughs> Could you possibly <laughs> explain the Jeff and Alicia Rasley internship and what it's about? The American Civil Liberties Union is an organization that I have admired since I was very young because it's the one institution in the U.S. that has been devoted for years and years and years to representing people who have been treated unjustly under the law and to being the sort of the legal warrior on social justice issues. And the ACLU has taken positions on things that I did not necessarily agree with. Famous one has been back in, I think it was the 70s or 80s, they represented Nazis several times when Nazi organizations and, and Ku Klux Klan organizations have been not denied permits to demonstrate. You know, the vast majority of issues, I, I agree with the sides they've taken. And so I uh, knew that the Indiana um, uh, chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union had internships uh, that were unpaid. And so they'd have law students and college students working for them as volunteers. And I have thought for a long, long time, that's just wrong. I think an intern should be paid. I don't think it's right to have people working actual jobs and not getting paid. Now, if they get college credit or get law school credit for it, okay, that's different. But these were summer internships and, you know, hooray for these kids that they were willing to do that. But so Alicia and I agreed that we would donate enough money to the organization to set up a fund that would pay the interns. So uh, for the last two years now, their in interns have all been paid because of the revenue that our donation has created. So out of your 14 books, which one is your most favorite or the one you're most proud of? When I'm asked that question, it's it's always it's the last one. So my most recent one, because it's the one I, you know, I still feel the most bonded with, the most into. And so the, the last one, 72 Wisdoms. But I will say a, another book was the most fun book to write. And the title of that book is Anarchist Republican Assassin. It's a book of fiction. And it's primarily the story of a guy who, when he was young, he was in an anarchist organization that went around the country and would try to turn peaceful demonstrations into riots. And eventually he grew out of that and realized that this was really not a good thing. But anyway, that was, that was a lot of fun to write.
And you've been on over 150 different radio and podcast shows. What was the goal for that? So the first time I was on a radio show, really before podcasts were were popular, I was contacted because a local radio host of a show knew that I was a lawyer, mountain climber who had this project over in Nepal, and he thought it would be interesting to talk to me about that and, you know, have me on a show. And I thought, well, that's, you know, that's a great opportunity for the foundation because I can tell people about the what I think is the wonderful work we were doing over in Nepal. And maybe listeners would then want to donate to the foundation. And some did. So I thought, wow, that's, that's, you know, great. Since then, with varying degrees of effort, have tried to to offer myself up as a guest and for people like me who at least think they have something to say for listeners to hear. Now, let's kind of jump to a different experience now. You also trekked and climbed at Nepal. What was your experience like there? In terms of travel, adventure, physical challenge. It was the most wonderful and the most difficult things I've ever done. Climbing a Himalayan peak is just tremendously physically demanding. And, you know, people die doing it. Assuming you don't die, at some point during that experience or by the time you finish it, you're going to be very near the ultimate physical sacrifice you can endure so you've already expended a lot of energy done really difficult hiking and so then when you're already you know kind of worn out to attempt this climb as long as you don't die and you have enough energy that you can at least appreciate what's around you it's the most spectacular scenery in the world i mean it's magnificently beautiful Well, this has been a very in-depth and very interesting interview. So just to kind of end this off, how can readers find out more about your books and what you generally do as an author? I have a website, which is my full name. Uh, so it's, you know, www.jeffrey, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y, Raisley, R-A-S, L-E-Y. I also have an author page on Amazon. So if you you just Google my name or go to Amazon and input my name or go to my website, you'll find information about all of my books and the BASA Foundation and some other interesting stuff. Do you have any advice for aspiring authors out there? And I don't think this is very original, but the uh, fundamental advice I give, and and by the way, I, for years, I've taught a memoir writing class through the Indiana Writing Center, and sort of most basic message I try to give the students is write what you love. Find something you love and write about it. And, you know, because if, if you're writing, if you're forcing yourself to write about something and it feels like work, well, then I hope it's a job and you get paid for it. But if it's to create a work of art, to create literature, it should be an act of love. All right. Well, this has been an amazing interview. Do you have any final words, any other pieces of things you want to say to end this off? Well, I just I want to thank you, Jimbo, for having me. It's it's been My great point. talking to you, and you know I I hope that your message and your willingness to have people like me come on your show spreads out and is a light to the whole world, and particularly to what I hope is an inspiring message of love. Definitely.
All right. So today we just had uh, Mr. Rasley. He was an excellent guest. And we're just going to end this off with a few quick shout outs. The first shout out is going to be our affiliate partner, LifeWork Systems. They essentially do a lot of different things, but they're basically an HR superstar company. They go into large corporate businesses and they essentially improve their in, their HR infrastructure, their employee infrastructure, and allow for a better collegial environment in a business. The next thing we have is our YouTube channel. It's up there on the upper right corner. Subscribe now, ring that bell. We are slowly growing in subscribers and we would love to have more people so that they can enjoy great content like this. The next thing I would like to discuss is going to be down to the left. This is our Roku channel. We have currently been publishing episodes now for the last two years on Roku TV. This great episode will also be on Roku TV, so check that out there when you get the message. Final thing is Jimbo Para Services. We also are a drop servicing business and a marketing agency. We can make social media accounts for you. We can make content for you. We can automate your social media accounts and profiles so you won't have to ever touch it or work with it. I'll be managing it. And we could also do the same thing for podcasts as well. Again, we're out here to help people and make it easier for a lot of you small business owners to automate your businesses so you can focus on what's important. All right. Again, thank you again, Mr. Rosley. Thank you again, everyone, for watching the show. I'm Jimbo Paris. This is the Jimbo Paris Show. Thank you for listening to the Jimbo Paris Show. 